implementing Oracle Exadata case study. The presentation will be done mainly by uh, Mike Aldrich from Linkshare. He's a senior MBA in Linkshare, and uh, Mark Fielding, a uh, senior consultant in Bitcoin. Uh, and I am I'm Alec Amash. I work in Oracle Backpack Group, and uh, we work closely with uh, Linkshare and Bitcoin to successfully implement, implement this project. Before I give the before I give the mic uh, the microphone to Mike and Mark, uh, I just want to uh, shortly talk about about Linkshare. Linkshare is uh, is one of the early pioneers in the online affiliate marketing uh, industry, and 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 they are one of the largest uh, pay for performance affiliate marketing uh, networks. Also, they are they, they are based. Uh, a good based environment enables uh, their mission, uh, their mission to manage and, and evaluate their uh, affiliate program uh, actively, uh, uh, actively and uh, yeah, using the internet. Uh, Linkshare is, is part of Rakuten, uh, and Rakuten is one of the world's largest uh, and, and most comprehensive. Internet uh, service companies. They provide services, and leading services, and in, uh, in a lot of areas like e-commerce, uh, portal and media travel, uh, professional sport, and financial services. Uh, I will give now the microphone to Mike and uh, Mark to do the presentation. for the introduction. Um, as I mentioned, we'll do a quick introduction here, talk about our legacy <coughs> environment, the issues, um, quick overview, um, talk about uh, some of the, uh, our GoLive experience, uh, talk about some results of our GoLive, um, and uh, sh uh, shut down with some conclusion recommendations, and we will have a short question and answer period. So, uh, Linkshare, uh, we're a uh, full service online marketing company search, lead gen, and affiliate marketing. Uh, what we do is uh, essentially uh, we develop relationships between advertisers, merchants, um, and publishers. Uh, the advertisers will provide us with product feeds. Uh, we link them up. We facilitate those relationships with the publishers who uh, publish uh, uh, banner ads and such. Uh, what we do is uh, keep track of impressions served, um, clicks processed, and most importantly to our customers are the transactions associated with those clicks. A little bit about Pythian, uh, the company I work with. Uh, we are a local leader in database uh, and as well the infrastructure management, all the infrastructure that goes around those databases. Um, we work uh, with the Oracle Core environment with uh, various Oracle technologies surrounding that, including the Oracle Music business suite. Um, we also work with MySQL and um, we do do a little bit of work with the uh, evil folks up the coast as well, unfortunately. Um, we were founded in 1997, so we've been around for coming on 15 years here. Um, nine employees uh, worldwide, um, around 140 clients, uh, again around the globe, um, and we do 24-7 uh, support for all those clients. Um, we've been working with Linkshare for now uh, several years. Um, we work with their, we've been working in managing their Oracle OLTP environment, um, again providing the 24 by 7 managed services with them. And this has been an expansion of the Linkshare relationship to um, start being involved with the Exadata implementation. Um, our role particularly in the Exadata implementation has been working on the earlier stages where we're looking at the different vendors available, um, offering vendor selection advice, then moving on to deployment planning, uh, proof of concept, um, the implementation itself, of course, um, uh, platform migration assistance, um, performance optimization, and you'll see all kinds of details uh, here later on in the presentation of what we've been doing there. And we're also offering ongoing managed services for this environment. Pass it on to Mike to talk about the architecture. So as Mark had mentioned, Pythian is providing support currently for uh, our OLTP systems. Um, they provide a uh, source for our data warehouse, we have redundant two data centers in different states. 
data coming into those gets passed through our ETL service into our data warehouse. Reporting is done using OBIE, also in two data centers uh, for uh, disaster recovery and redundancy. Uh, looking at this legacy picture, you can see that the data warehouse, there's only one of them, uh, whereas everything else is fully redundant, uh, which is essentially a, a little bit of a pain point for us. It was. Uh, the old environment, just digging in here a little deeper, um, you can see the OBIE redundant, as we had mentioned. We have Informatica Power Center for our ETL. Uh, we have uh, near real-time loads. We try to load as soon as data becomes available. It's internet data, so it comes in at all times, high volume. Uh, the, the system supported by a, uh, a GIGI, net, e, GIGI uh, network. Uh, it's an MPP system. Data is spread across numerous nodes, uh, a hash uh, method, uh, each node having a subset of the data. So when you run a query, you really need every single node in the system up and available to return that data. Um, there are 18 nodes, each with a piece of the data with direct attached storage. Some of the issues we've seen in the existing environment uh, or the uh, our legacy environment in the uh, share system is that uh, we've been receiving uh, slow response times. And one of our mantras at Rockwell is speed, speed, speed. And um, uh, one of the uh, major drivers in developing this new uh, infrastructure is to speed up response times and to deliver that kind of speed to our clients. Uh, Real-time idea, real-time data, Mike was uh, mentioning that in the internet space, um, data comes in over time and analytics are expected to uh, reflect the data as it comes in. This is something that has been a bit of a challenge in our older environment, and uh, we're definitely looking to, uh, to maintain that. Uh, another issue was uptime. Uh, because of some of the infrastructure issues Mike mentioned, for example, we had RAID 5 disk, and um, if we lost any disk, our uh, array would uh, go into a degraded mode and slow down response time across the entire database. Um, if we lost any uh, node, any, any one piece of that, um, all the data associated with that, so one seventeenth of our data uh, would be not available, and then we could run queries against uh, basically against the system at all. Um, we were having issues with high data volume growth. So we were approaching the capacity um, in terms of the amount of disk space available in our existing system, and um, to compound that, we were running into uh, power issues in and uh, space issues in the data center where we couldn't um, easily add capacity to the system as we had it. And as well being MPP, uh, adding enough node involves rebalancing your entire system, so it's not a particularly easy thing to do. Um, so it was to the point where even if we're looking at um, adding uh, very large clients, um, literally would not have the capacity to handle those um, in our analytics environment. So cost savings again, uh, particularly due to the issues in the, uh, in the data center, uh, were definitely a driver. Uh, this group, uh, go ahead. Um, you know, somebody said once, uh, you know, build it and they will come. Uh, that's basically what happened to us. When we built a, a good data warehouse, um, as people started to hear how uh, good it was, they were getting the data and the answers to the questions that they needed. Uh, we were able to put more and more users on, more and more data. And this graph will sort of show you what happened over time. Uh, the, the blue bars depict um, that massive growth of users along with the growth of users, uh, became uh, a uh, growth in requests, queries against the database, uh, and response time suffered as a result. So we talked a little bit about the business side, and uh, as well as the business side, we had some corresponding challenges uh, in the IT environment, particularly that we had uh, an older system that was nearing its end of life. It was the time to replace that. Um, hardware, of course, keeps getting faster, the disks keep more capacity, and it was really the time for a wholesale replacement. Um, we were having what I alluded to a bit earlier, uh, very frequent hardware failures, and um, they were all impacting availability in the system. Um, performance capacity, data volume capacity, <coughs> um, we just didn't have room to add a lot of these more clients. Uh, data center power limits, which I've already talked before, and again, this MPP architecture issue with uh, the field So as we moved ahead, we divided our project into several phases. Uh, in the 
first phase, we went through a vendor selection, looking at numerous products, uh, trying to see which fit best for us. We uh, planned in that phase our data migration, conversion of our current uh, data loads, analytics queries, uh, time for quality assurance after we went live, uh, loaded all that data, and then uh, an initial go live. Phase two was a second site in another data center, which followed the exact same methodology, uh, followed by phase three, which was retirement of the legacy system. Looking at Exadata, several factors that uh, came up uh, high for us uh, is choosing that as our uh, platform of choice. Uh, we really like the, the failover that uh, was provided by Exadata, its ability to scale up, uh, operate in degraded mode as we said before. Uh, we had problems with just uptime availability. Uh, Exadata addressed those. Had a very small uh, physical footprint, uh, along with um, very low power consumption, which was a big concern in the data centers that we operate out of. Uh, or having Oracle in-house, we had staff who were already familiar with Oracle's SQL syntax, uh, and it's also just the uh, availability of people in the market, consultants, employees, to augment our staff. Um, and the cost of ownership, of course. So this uh, high availability slide, you'll notice it'll be very similar to the slide we had a few uh, slides ago in terms of the older system, um, except that there's a few differences right in the middle here. Um, so our front-end environment is running OEID, uh, the old SQL Oracle <coughs> Business Intelligence Enterprise Edition, um, and that environment's always been highly available. Uh, in each of our data centers, we have multiple web servers, multiple app servers. Again, ETL has always been highly available. But uh, the issue we've had before is in the analytics database. So now with Exadata in place, we have redundant networking, not multiple switches. Um, the rack cluster, of course, is entirely redundant, so we can afford to lose uh, entire nodes in the rack database. Um, the backend networking, the infinite band, is redundant, as well as the storage servers themselves. Again, data is all duplicated between multiple storage servers. So we can lose disks, we can lose entire storage servers. Um, without even any impact on performance. Uh, so uh, our data model, essentially, we run a, 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 an operational data store receiving uh, data from our front-end OLTP systems. Um, essentially serves as a, a staging area to feed our data warehouse. The data warehouse itself uh, is a star schema. Uh, has a handful of very large fact tables some extremely large dimensional tables. Uh, like I had mentioned, we have merchants who bring our uh, upload uh, products to us um, on a regular basis. Uh, product dimension is huge. Um, we have a standard date dimension um, and some of the dimensions with a very large number of rows. So one of the changes for us coming from massively parallel structure to uh, more of an Oracle environment is that uh, Massively parallel systems do have a constant partitioning and actually a mandatory constant partitioning, whereby all the data is partitioned against, uh, in this case, we would have had 17 data nodes. So uh, this has been very different in the Oracle side where uh, we have been able to use date-based partitioning and um, some hash sub-partitioning underneath that. And uh, those are huge advantages for us because on date-based partitioning, for example, if we're recompressing um, data with on the compression section, one month's worth of data, we can take the partitions for that month and do those separately from the rest of the table. We can do uh, uh, any type of data-based operations uh, using the inside the, sub -parti the partitions and subpartitions where we wouldn't have been able to do that before. Uh, again, in a massive parallel structure, uh, we need to make sure the data is uh, equally balanced and absolutely equally balanced um, between all the other tables. So what we would have done is uh, needed to create sort of the keys and use that for just about all the data access using partitioning on that and uh, basically having that same partitioning scheme everywhere. In Oracle, we have a lot more flexibility to, um, again, we use database partitioning, but in some of our uh, dimension tables, we are using different partitioning schemes and we have a lot of flexibility to customize that based on the way we access our data. Um, 
Another issue, and this uh, turned into a bit of a data quality issue for us, is that uh, the only primary keys on our massive parallel system we could use were ones involving that surrogate key. And that surrogate key is a, uh, a key that's assigned by our ETL systems. So we would find that we would get actual data duplication in some cases because there's no way in the database we could enforce uniqueness based on the source data. And uh, on the Oracle side, we are using global indexes. Uh, and uh, with those global indexes, we can enforce uh, uniqueness on any column we choose to. Uh, another issue is that in a master parallel uh, architecture, we would literally be taking the network to replicate small tables all across the nodes uh, for a number of the types of queries we use. And even for larger joins, we still have to replicate those tables across all nodes. So it's a huge amount of network bandwidth we're talking about. If we're joining, for example, one of our dimension tables with hundreds of millions of rows against fact tables, all those rows need to move between all the different nodes with every uh, almost a Cartesian join type combination. So it was uh, very heavy on the network. And what would happen is that if you're running a big uh, join intensive query, it would impact uh, performance on the entire system because um, the network would just be overloaded. So to move the data from our old legacy system onto the new platform, we basically di divided our table objects into uh, three categories and divvied that up amongst different uh, members of IT. Um, for the large tables, um, we uh, exported them out of uh, the legacy system to flat files, um, and then we use Oracle SQL uh, direct path loads to load them onto um, the, uh, the new data warehouse. Uh, we did that uh, using uh, an NFS mount. I should mention Micro had an excellent collection of shell scripts that would automate the whole process, uh, checking row counts and uh, notifying when other pieces were done, uh, managing the normalization, which uh, really did speed up our process. Uh, moving on to the medium-sized tables, uh, just because the amount of work of creating control files and the overhead involved in SQL loader, what we did is we used the Informatic Power Center, which is the same application we're using on the on our ETL to maintain all our tables currently. So we just had that configured to start with an absolutely empty table and uh, load the rules in one by one. And uh, we had a little bit of an issue there in that because we had this configured to do basically single row inserts, so we'd send an insert for a row and then send another insert, and uh, we found this to be very slow. So uh, what we ended up doing is the larger tables from this that we'd originally decided we were going to use Informatica for, we actually moved into the category of using SQL loader. And now for the really small tables, these are tables that would have been in our tables, sometimes 10, 100,000 rows. And uh, we ended up using the migration tool inside of the developer. And the big advantage for us as DBAs was that uh, <coughs> it was a tool that our ATL developers could use independently. So we basically gave them a place on the X data system. And they could just, because of the volumes of the data, they could just work on the desktop machines, get the data there. They were in charge of data quality anyway, so they could do um, all their data quality verifications. And um, from our DBA perspective, we had a, um, all those tables there and working, and they were managing the ETL system, so they were able to keep those up to date as well. Uh, one of the uh, major features in the XDA V2 that uh, was really exciting for us is the hybrid polymer compression. And uh, we ended up using a combination of both the traditional uh, compression as well as the, with the all TP compression and the advanced compression option, as well as the uh, newer hybrid polymer compression. And we did some tests on compression rates and you can see that um, we got maybe 1.5 to 3x on the ULTP compression, um, where it would jump to quite a bit more in the 5 to 15x range in the columnar compression um, against our, our actual data here. Um, but the big disadvantage is of the hybrid columnar compression is that it is built for archival data. So if you update a row in a columnar compressed table, it actually has to decompress that data on is receive it in a OLTP compressed data. So it's uh, not only is it very expensive performance wise, but also it, uh, it, reduce, it reduces the amount of compression we get because it's being recompressed with a less efficient option. Um, the other issue for us was um, that our ETL tool, as I was mentioning, does uh, inserts uh, row by row. And uh, the 
uh, hypercolumnic compression only works with bulk inserts, so we would um, only get OLTP compression with the, uh, our ATL system loaded directly anyways. So we ended up dividing our tables into, we took the very large fat tables and took the older partitions. So these are, because we were partitioned by date, these were the, uh, the data that had been loaded quite some time ago and was um, infrequently updated, if at all. Uh, and we used the uh, columnar compression for those. And for the remaining tables, we went with the OLTP compression, which is more flexible. Uh, now, as these, uh, table, as these partitions in the large tables get older, um, we uh, want to get the better compression of the columnar compression. So we developed a process using uh, similar to OLTP moves to rebuild the um, older partitions of these large tables as they become older. But I do mention the term semi-automated because um, we have these global indexes we're using to enforce primary keys. So we had to do a little bit of fancy footwork to work around that um, in uh, conjunction with the partition exchange so that, um, so that we could maintain the consistency of the data and still be able to do rebuilds without downtime. Uh, we did some compression rate tests. And this is taking a uh, sample partition of one of our tables and uh, these big red bars that you see are the size of the table. So um, this particular partition ended up being um, 130 megabytes uh, or so without the compression. <coughs> At that time, we tested it with um, the legacy system had um, a compression similar to our global LTP, and we got similar compression rates. So we were not quite to one compression. But then when we moved to the columnar compression, even at the query low level, which is the very lowest um, level columnar compression offered, it was again half the size of what it would have been with the OLTP compression. When we went to query high, again half the size of that. And, but after query high, we did end up seeing the condition returns. What you'll see on this white bar is uh, we benchmark the time it takes to load this 120 minutes of data to uh, get a bit of an idea of the overhead we need to connect. And uh, we can see that it, the overhead is quite minimal with OLTP, quite minimal in query low, still manageable in query high, but when we get into the archiving levels, it really uh, gets much, much higher. So when you're in archive high, this table took maybe 10 times longer to load. So uh, we ended up settling on the query highs, the method where we see the points of diminishing returns and sort of the best compromise between performance impact and the amount of compression we get. So we did some benchmarking actually before we went live. Um, because our legacy system was not Oracle, we couldn't uh, leverage real application testing. Um, we uh, used an open source tool called JMeter. We captured uh, actual queries coming into our production system uh, and we essentially replayed those back um, and were able to do that in a sort of controlled way, we could scale it up, we could see how the, the new system behaved if we doubled the, the, the number of uh, transactions and whatnot. So it gave us a good idea, actually, before we turned it over to anybody, you know, how the system was going to react. Uh, it was interesting that during this time, um, we were able to identify uh, some OLTP kind of queries uh, that could uh, use an index. When we built it initially, we didn't as per uh, Oracle recommendation, we didn't build any indexes other than primary keys uh, we needed for enforcing uniqueness and things. So it uncovered certain things like that. And so what we did is uh, running this benchmark, we, uh, we ran these uh, basically real world logs which were running through a full API environment, so it would have been an end-to-end -end test for us. And um, with this very limited indexing, and um, we had our tables partitioned on date, so we were hoping to get some uh, partition, but it didn't work very well for us. Um, the reason being that our, uh, our fact, big fact tables have a period key call, which is just a certain key has a number of date, and that would have been linked to a dimension table, which has the actual dates. And the problem was that in the queries, that in the where clause, the date is only in that dimension table. So we couldn't get any partition pruning at all on the main fact table itself. So the upshot of that is that uh, just about every report that ran it read the entire fact table. So we would read maybe 10, 15 years worth of data um, every time we ran a query. And I'll have to say that the XData machine ran very, very well considering the amount of data it had.
had to retrieve. It was a uh, beating our legacy system, even though it was retrieving 10, 15, 20 times more data. But um, what came into uh, what we realized is that when we ratcheted things up and added the concurrence, that on uh, a digital scale, that we can have, when we start getting a lot beyond four concurrent sessions, that things would get much, much slower. Um, just because of the volume of data we were retrieving off the system. So what we ended up doing is um, we went to a little bit of an older Oracle technology uh, designed for scarce star schemas like we are using in a data model, and that is to use bitmap indexes. So we created bitmap indexes on the main join columns and leveraging uh, bitmap and um, operations to be able to select this. And uh, the upshot of this is that it lets us uh, quite flexible for ad hoc reports for uh, quite a number of great predicates. Um, the combination of bitmap indexes um, gets a fairly efficient uh, way of retrieving that data. Uh, it scales significantly better because we were um, registered <coughs> far less data off disk. And the other big advantage is we had a number of resourcing uh, issues and timing issues and we just didn't have uh, the resources to be uh, re-architected in our data model. So um, we were able to do this with the queries as they were written in the system. Um, didn't need to make any changes to uh, make use of this. Um, but the downside of uh, using these bitmap indexes is that because these are regular index lookups, um, we don't get to take advantage of a lot of the XData features. So the XData storage offload um, features in terms of predicate filtering um, are not available for the type of uh, index range scans we're using. Um, we didn't get the advantage of storage indexes, for example. So uh, on our roadmap right now is to look at uh, uh, some query changes, some app changes, and even potentially some data model changes to let us use um, these queries by date, uh, select them right in the fact table, giving us the uh, partition pruning. And if we get the partition pruning, we can look at even taking out these map indexes and uh, really taking advantage of your saying specific features. So, uh, coming back to some of the benchmark slides, Mike was mentioning that uh, we did uncover a few issues when we were running our benchmark. Um, I would say a handful of queries. So this would have been less than 1% of the total number of queries. But we did see a handful that were running quite slow. And when we would look at the explaining plan, we'd see that the optimizer <coughs> was thinking it might get uh, one row or a very small number of rows from a subselect. And it ended up uh, not using uh, a lot of the indexes that were available. Bitmap side and uh, ran uh, very much slower than uh, we would have expected. So what we did is we ran the SQL training advisor against those queries, and for a good number of those queries, it was able to recommend a SQL profile. And uh, all that SQL profile would do is just correct the uh, incorrect assumptions uh, the optimizer was making in terms of the number of rows. And um, applying that uh, did fix those queries, but for um, for the rest, the SQL tuning advisor was basically saying, oh, just drop all your bitmap indexes and create regular B-tree indexes on every combination of joins, which is really not a viable option for us. So we ended up using one of the backend features in the SQL tuner, uh, SQL tuning advisor, to, um, instead of using its recommendations to sort of implant our own recommendations in terms of giving it hints using this import SQL profile function. And, um, what that would let us do is add hints to the queries as they came in, because we weren't able to do that from the app side. The database can see, okay, I know this query, I want to add this hint, and um, it would uh, tell to use the right query client in that case. So for our backup and recovery, we basically um, have a couple of media servers which are connected uh, via the InfiniBand. Um, and, uh, we're doing uh, full backups weekly, and we do the daily incremental. Um, those media servers are connected uh, currently to an EMC SAN uh, over fiber. Uh, and going forward, we're hoping to leverage the uh, existing uh, tape silos um, that we have um, that are supporting our legacy environments. We use uh, OEM Grid Control 10G uh, for monitoring uh, the whole environment. So we're monitoring all the, uh, all the various pieces of the database, so uh, it is an integrated product. So um, uh, back from the XDS storage servers themselves, the operating system, the clusters, uh, uh, we're using the whole, uh, we're monitoring the whole stack using the uh, enterprise manager product. 
one of, one of the things um, we found out that uh, some of the hardware monitoring just was not in place when we went live. We were an early adopter, um, so uh, some of it uh, was just not there for us. So we leveraged uh, uh, Foglight, which is a tool that we had used for our other platforms to monitor those until that became available. Um, we had one case where we had a, a power supply which are fully redundant. One of them went bad. We noticed it uh, just by chance when we were in the data center. Um, the uh, 112131 uh, has a, uh, a fix in there that uh, corrects that so we'll be able to, and once we apply that, we'll be able to know for those types of hardware outages. And one of the specific issues we noticed with the storage server is that most of the monitoring uh, metrics have a default value. But um, in the case of, at least in the 10G version we're using, the, uh, for any of the storage metrics, there were just no defaults. And so we came up with some, but um, we really uh, weren't able to get a good idea of what some of the best practices might be. So um, we, we did try some. I think we have some, some logical ones, but we're hoping again for the next version that um, there are some best practices to be. So our go live plan was, uh, basically um, done in a, in a phased approach. Um, we had a, our ETL system uh, loading both the legacy and the new data warehouse. Um, after we did our quality assurance on that, we weaned on some of our internal users um, so that we get some first impressions from folks in-house before we opened it up to our customers. When we were <coughs> happy with it, we phased in uh, our users a little bit at a time, we with 1%, 10%, etc. over well, a period of about two weeks. Uh, that kind of gave us a chance to see how the system behaved, rather than just switch everybody over in one fell swoop. Uh, and we kind of always had the option to go back to the legacy system and kind of dig in deeper to see if there are any problems, which we luckily didn't really encounter. Uh, over that period of two weeks, we were up on 100% traffic and looking good. This is a quick chart. It's, uh, you see a lot of uh, bars, but what this chart comes from is we're using an external monitoring service to uh, look at the response time of some sample reports. And all of those lines represent a sample report. And um, you'll notice that there's a lot of variability in that uh, until you get about halfway through the graph. And so this system was uh, monitoring reports off our old platform. And um, as soon as we switched over to the X data platform, we noticed um, not only the average period time would go up, but uh, particularly the peaks would have been uh, quite a bit more predictable. Um, we were seeing uh, very performance we were much happier with, um, and we're not seeing the type of period time modes from other companies we've seen before. So we did, we did see a dramatic improvement in um, response time. So going back to the uh, business slide, um, we're going to in terms of wrapping up the results of our implementation, um, we were seeing slow response times, and now we're seeing um, significantly better, up to 10 times faster, even in some cases more, um, from the, from previous um, real-time data. We are getting um, data ETL loads are running every five minutes, um, and they're, they're definitely keeping up with the rate of data that's coming in. Um, we're now meeting our uptime SLAs when we wouldn't have been meeting them before, and we're even exceeding them. Um, and uh, because of the availability of the column regression, um, we are able to handle a lot more data volume with both than we would have been able to before. Uh, in terms of adding new clients again, now we have both uh, data storage capacity and processing capacity to be able to handle um, significantly more uh, number of clients than uh, in systems handling right now. And uh, we're achieving cost savings, particularly when it comes on the data center side, where now instead of uh, one physical rack, we're using three, again, uh, significantly less power. So uh, again, from a wrap up, a few recommendations, a few, uh, a few lessons learned from uh, other people who are, uh, a few folks here are looking at your own exit implementation. And the first of all is um, just choose a qualified partner. I'll get uh, Mike here to. Yeah, I mean, we had uh, Oracle in-house on our OLTP system. Uh, I'm. Uh, not really an Oracle DBA until early in this year. I had worked on other platforms, um, including our legacy system. Uh, 
so bringing expertise uh, like Oracle in, uh, like the folks at Pythian who we had experience with was quite helpful uh, to really get them engaged and get us up running quickly. Uh, additionally, I guess uh, a legacy system had a lot of indexes that we built to support maybe a query that didn't even run, so we did a lot of cleanup along the way. Um, so that helped us a lot, so we, we were able to save some disk space, we, didn't necessarily mislead the optimizer on queries that went. We built only the ones that we needed. Uh, we, uh, you know, the fact that we benchmarked our performance before we went live, there were really very few surprises when we actually turned real customers onto the system. Uh, the column of compression, uh, particularly on that old data, uh, we, we as an internet company have some, some data that's extremely old and it's important to some customers, but they don't fre frequently uh, access it, and it's rarely if ever updated. So, uh, you know, compressing that, even <coughs> further uh, through archival compression, uh, is a big help. Uh, and then the phasing in the deployment in, in, uh, over time, management chunks, uh, just having a good plan. Uh, and then uh, OEM, uh, just making sure that we had the diagnostic and tuning packs there, licensed, ready for us. It was, it was a big help to help us identify and look in deeper as to what was happening at given points in time. <coughs> so, uh, uh, Pythian, you know, was there by our side, teaching me, teaching Lin Chair, helping us along the way, it really got us live quickly uh, and uh, successfully. Very few bumps in the road. We're very happy to have them aboard. So talking about uh, what, Pith what Pythian does in terms of XA deployments, um, we have been involved in the whole structure of this one particularly. Um, but we do offer uh, validation of, of plans, validation of migration issues, uh, validation of go-live uh, vendor selection assistance. Um, we're also able to help uh, with implementation risk, um, a lot of which is uh, involved with leveraging um, our experience um, with the various local technologies involved uh, and the continuous improvement we've been able to get and to share with our clients. Um, if you're interested in taking the next step, there is an email address there, and I'm sure there are, um, there are lots of people on the other end who, uh, who are gonna be happy to talk to you there. And um, as a quick incentive here, uh, for the people attending here, uh, I'm told that there is an offer uh, for people who are looking to try us out. Um, we are offering uh, three hours of uh, consulting services to qualified attendees. So, Again, you have that email address there, and um, or if you want to come up at the end of the session, uh, we can put you in touch with the right people. And now we're uh, on to the last slide of the presentation. Um, I'm sharing a few uh, links to uh, to some websites that uh, will be useful. I mean, uh, we can share a corporate website, some of the, uh, more information about Exadata, uh, another article I wrote um, regarding uh, some of the experiences making most of Oracle Exadata. The other thing I'll point out in particular is uh, two uh, MyOcal support notes that I've found to be very useful. The first one, which is this 888-828-01. And by the way, this presentation will be recorded. It will be available on Oracle On Demand afterwards. So um, if you are uh, wanting to look at some of these slides, they, they are going to be available. Um, but this 888-828.1 um, note is the recommended versions of um, all the various components. So we have the, the cell image, we have versions of the, the, the database, the database bundle, the hatch, the grid infrastructure, and all that is um, consolidated into one node and kept very well up to date by the folks on the Oracle support side. And the second node, the 757552.1, is a note talking about best practices um, for Exadata. They have uh, a whole bunch of categorized tips and tricks of uh, things they've run, to, run into and uh, definitely worth a quick read. Um, they can uh, definitely save us a lot of time. So before I turn this over for questions, uh, a few uh, notes of administrative nature. Uh, because this presentation is being recorded, if you want to uh, use the microphone that's available uh, in the middle of the room for questions, that means people listening to the recording of this presentation will be able to hear that a little bit better. And the second note for uh, all of uh, you guys who toughed it out is we do have a, uh, a bit of a giveaway here. Um, some of you folks might have seen on the screen a bit of an airplane demonstration um, with uh, Team Oracle and the Oracle Challenger plane, who are, I believe, out signing autographs outside the room at some point during the conference as well. Um, 
we are offering um, two flights tomorrow on um, on his plane. Um, he, I guess he takes passengers, so um, if you want to uh, do some aerobatics, um, just drop off your business card uh, with my colleague Vanessa over here on the side, and um, we can uh, make some of those things work. So uh, thanks very much, folks, for attending. Um, you see our email addresses here if some questions come up, and um, we're open to taking questions from the room. Sure, I think I'll step to the mic. What is the size of your uh, legacy uh, database and how long will the process take to, uh, to the data pumping to the machine? So after using the, the column of compression and um, the current segment size is in the range of six or seven terabytes. Um, in terms of the, uh, the amount of time, I mean, our whole implementation project beginning to end was in the range of um, 6 to 12 months. Um, the actual data migration was done over probably a few weeks, um, just because we were doing a lot of verification um, on making sure the data was all right. I want to look at this one. As one of your uh, back in the recovery uh, strategy, uh, did you have to use the FRA in the ex-data environment? As part of your backup and recovery strategy, did you use FRA? Yes, yeah, so we are using FRA. Um, we are working with the best practice recommendation, which is to uh, allocate 20% of usable space to FRA. And we're using that, we're not using it for backups, but we are using it to, uh, to store uh, archive logs. And uh, we are making use of flashback database as well in that space. Uh, final question. Um, you had a a graph in terms of your um, compression using different uh, yeah, uh, algorithms, you know, the HCC, um, <coughs> archive low, archive I. Do you happen to have a graph in terms of like uh, performance versus compression? So um, this white line was the performance numbers we took in terms of loading data. So um, we saw um, where where we left where we went past crude high, but we saw a big drop off. In is that like response time or creation time? This was uh, th this was the time it took to create the object. Um, we didn't formally benchmark response time, but uh, we found it to be it's it's tough to measure this because I mean some data is in the memory cache, some data is in the flash cache, uh, some data is coming off disk. But uh, I would expect um, if your data is at least coming off raw disk, uh, numbers that are fairly similar. Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing your question. Before settling on accelerator, did you consider any other solutions as an alternative? Yes, we uh, we actually did, uh, did a comprehensive valuation of four different vendors, including um, including the Park Cell platform, including uh, our, our legacy vendor, and um, we ended up settling um, on Oracle basically on total cost of ownership and a number of things that we mentioned in that slide. So, I mean, how does the, I, mean, I understand the comparison between your old system and the new system. How does, what, what are the sticking points uh, that uh, you know, like uh, highlighted accelerator compared to the other solutions you mentioned? And I will come up, just back up to the slide where we talk about that. These are our, our deciding factors. So, um, we, we did evaluate the failover capability. Oracle was the only platform of all the ones we tested that really had the uh, capabilities of Oracle wrapped for the really good degraded performance. And we're losing some parts of the system. So that was one of our big uh, factors. Again, excellent cost of ownership. Um, the compression was um, similar or better than a lot of the competition. You mentioned the desire to uh, remove that surrogate key from your back table so that it, you could you know, go away from using the mapping <coughs> uh, and use more of the uh, VX data capability down at the storage level. Uh, how will that affect your load in terms of, uh, are you spending a lot of time building the bitmap indexes now, or is that something that you're managing? Well, I mean, those, those bitmap indexes are built, I mean, they're, they're getting updated. We're not noticing, um, after we added those bitmap indexes, it didn't really have any noticeable impact on our data load speeds, uh, mainly because our data load system is using these 
these uh, single row inserts, which are very latency intensive. It's happening over an Ethernet network, um, over even a WAN link. So um, we found that the bottlenecks right now, in terms of our data loads, are actually not at the database server at all. So adding indexes didn't really make a, a noticeable impact on that. It sounds like your schema is fairly simple, a star schema. Um, but I'm curious, are there any objects that were difficult to migrate over? You ran into other issues besides, I mean, you said you ran into some issues with the partition elimination, but that's kind of the next big feature. But were there any difficulties in any objects in migration? Uh, the, the objects were fairly simple. I mean, we really don't reinforce RI through the detailed tools, or the work. you know, that wasn't in the database. Um, we really don't have a lot of, like, say, mob data fairly straightforward data types and whatnot. One other question. Uh, you said that your legacy system had some form of compression. Uh, can, you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I guess the legacy system used the same, uh, was it LVZ? Is that the algorithm? I can't recall. It's the same algorithm that uh, Oracle is using on their regular OLTV compression. So we saw comparable compression for the OLTV Basically, the idea is to eliminate um, it keeps a dictionary of, of row data so that if uh, you have a lot of rows with the exact same data, um, it would be able to, uh, to, to save storage from that. Thank you. Um, uh, what are the parameters that you use to uh, come up with half rack size? How did you buy a half rack instead of a quarter rack? Uh, you know, it, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, our, uh, initially, we were looking at a quarter rack um, when we went through the numbers, and I guess that's that was based on uh, conversations with Oracle and, and whatnot. And it, they were thinking at the time, and this goes back to shortly after uh, Open World last year, that that would support basically the I/O, etc. Looking at it a little deeper, I think we started to realize, you know, we have a bit more data and we wanted to plan for the future. So we weren't building this and then having to grow it, you know, two months later. Uh, so that, that factored in part of it. So at this point, uh, we have a half rack in our primary system, a half rack in our uh, field over uh, second system as well. Uh, second question is, uh, do you consider uh, what, are, what type of disks are you running on, uh, SAS or SATA disks? They're SAS disks. Um, did you do any comparison with uh, SAS versus SATA? Uh, for us, it was just what the, uh, we wanted the system that would give us the highest cost for the disk I.O. operations, and the I.O.s per second on a SAS disk are significantly better than SATA disks. Uh, the last question, uh, how many databases do you have on that half rack? Uh, it's a, a, a single database. Uh, do you plan to uh, put more databases, or? No, we're hoping not to actually. We're hoping to go the other way. And the reason is, is because um, on the database servers, each of those database instances has a separate SG, separate PG. So we find we can make uh, optimal use of the memory we have available by um, actually having only one instances and then uh, using schemas or whatever we need to do separation. Um, one, one last question. Sure. Okay, sorry about that. Um, do you have your database? Uh, Parameters here, the sizing parameters, what, what is your SGA size, what is your PGA size on each of those instances? Sorry, uh, can you read the question? Uh, what are the database parameters that you use to uh, size the database? Yeah, so at this point we're using a, um, we're sizing it even a little bit larger than the best uh, practice recommendations. Um, we have a 32 gig SGA and 32 gig SGA. Um, normally on an XNA system, you would probably use a smaller SGA and opt to a bigger PGA. But because we have all of these uh, bitmap indexes, they are indexed in the buffer cache, where uh, MSC operates with norm normally. So we actually get more benefits from the buffer cache than we would in a typical exit in the setup. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Just two questions. Sure. What's your DR strategy? What's uh, the? What is your offsite DR strategy? Yeah, so what we're using is we have our Informatica ETL tool which takes this uh, data from our OLTP system. And so what we've, uh, what we've done in the past, even our legacy system, is it would take uh, data change images and insert them one by one. So we've just programmed our ATL system 
instead of inserting one by one into one system, all the inserts he runs on one system just to run on the other. So we're not using data guard, we're not using any formal replication, we're, uh, we're moving the data in from the front, and that lets us do a little bit of a better system in terms of our active active. We, uh, we are planning to be able to run a full load of customers on both sites and still have those sites up to date. Is it mainly because of the size of the database you can't build the data across? The, the size of the... What is the size, size of your database? Is it a multi terabyte, I guess? Six, 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 around six terabytes? Of, you know, the, after compression, yeah. Okay, the second question is, uh, what about non-production environment? Do we have any separate Excel data system for a non-production databases? Yes, we do. Um, so, uh, in one of our sites, actually, I, mean, I did mention half rack, but it is technically a full rack system. And uh, we are using a quarter of that rack as a uh, dev QA environment. We also have, um, we're using some virtual servers that are, uh, that are non exadata for some of our functional testing and data modeling and that type of thing. Thank you. Thanks. slide maybe uh, we worded it incorrectly. So we had real-time updates in both both systems. Uh, when we had an outage in the older system, it would take longer. So if we were down for an hour, it might take us two hours to restart our ETL and catch up to real-time again, just because of the lag. Uh, we don't have that. Lag. We're able to catch up much quicker and be back you know, in, in you know, no time. But in, in both systems, the data is fed in as it becomes available. Okay. And, and for your backup, you talked about uh, you've got InfiniBand and a media server uh, and using RMAN. Are you using any other backup product beyond RMAN? Uh, at this point, we're just using RMAN. We're using RMAN to stage the Tucson. And uh, we do have a tape library, which I believe is an IBM tape library. Yes, it is. And uh, so what we're doing is, at that point, the RMAN backup is sitting on the file system, right. and we can use a regular editing agent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you try DBFS for uh, any backup purposes? Like, you know, backups, do you try any DBFS file system? Uh, no, we haven't worked much with DBFS. Um, the issue for us is that um, we didn't want to use large amounts of storage from our database uh, just for backups, especially when we had a media server and another SAM available. Um, DBSS is an option, though, I mean, for, for large volume data loads. Um, it's something we've been considering, but we haven't actually done any testing with it yet. So, how did you do it? Like, uh, you said that you used the Infinity uh, connected with SAM. You, you connect the SAM with the Infinity? Yeah, so this is an interesting question because um, Oracle does not permit you to add, um, say, a fiber channel card to your, um, to your database server, which would be the traditional way of doing backups to a uh, separate media server or a tape library. So what we've done is that media server has both an InfiniBand card and a fiber channel card. So it runs RMAN on that machine. It takes the data off the InfiniBand and then um, copies it back across the fiber channel. Do you have any more information on that? Like, I'm interested in that, knowing that information. Uh, the other question is like uh, the query performance, right? Mm -hmm. What is the active data that you use to run the reports? Like, is, um, what is the amount of data? Then you said six terabytes, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. Out of six terabyte, what is the amount of data on which you run the reports? The report, the, the report uh, response time, you said. Uh, what is the kind of an? Uh, I want to know what kind of activity it is. Is it like a concurrent uh, report process running or? Uh, uh, what it is, it's, uh, I mean, from the front end, it's a, it's a web application. So our clients are in there, and they just hit a button to kick off their report. Okay. So how, how concurrently they run, like, they, how many reports? Because we are also going to negotiate on that. We like to understand, like, what is your uh, concurrency yeah. of reports, and what kind of volume you are it is taking, and what is it? Uh, I think I'm going to, my um, BI architect, Dave Ramos, is here. I think he could probably answer that best. Uh, so we have, in our we are generating, Mike. Uh, upwards of uh, 150 to 250 on peak days, 200,000 requests per day from people we have. Uh, to repeat what Dave was saying, just for people who are listening in on the microphone, he said uh, 150 to 250,000 per day 
requests. So what we're doing is we're doing the requirements of tests. We're doing about 4,000 requirements of twice. But because you're using indexes, right? You're not really using the accelerator power. I mean, since the query high and query low, compression technologies gives you good performance, right? Uh, in this case, you're just using indexes. What is it, what is it making to run the reports better? Uh, well, the, the, system, the system in general has more capacity. I mean, right. where, um, query offloading, you know, other things, but that's the only thing you're re relying on right now because you're not using compression the current partitions. Well, much faster I.O. path is one thing. I mean, we have the infinite band field. Right. Um, we're not using archive compression. Right. We are using compression. And our compression ratios are much higher on the new system than they are on the legacy system. So compression is essentially reducing the amount of I.O. So we are, in fact, leveraging that additional, in addition to the flash edge that is uh, available in the But are you guys really running the reports against the compression partitions? Yes, I think we are. We are real time. Our customers expect real time answers to the data through our system real time. So we do not do, we do not leverage any application or layer caching. Uh, everything is. No, what I'm going to say, you load the data, right? You load the data under the current partitions. Then you do compress, compress the partition right away to run the reports. How are the reports running actually? Or you will hang with the compression on the server. Or it depends. So you define the partition, you define the, the, the partition strategy, right. and you monitor the or you will compress the data. Just in the interest of time, I know we're running uh, pretty close to our 1.30. Uh, I know Dave and will be available afterwards if you uh, wouldn't mind taking that offline. One more question. Just a couple of questions. What sure. is, uh, did you look at resource manager to input concurrency? And uh, uh, second question is, uh, did you make explicit use of the flash cache? So, um, first question, um, resource manager. Yes, we are using resource manager. Um, the reason we are using it is because um, we do need to manage the parallelism. We had an issue where uh, using default parallelism, we'd have one query using 128 parallel query slaves. And obviously, if uh, just for because of memory issues on the database servers, we couldn't run the type of concurrency we need. So at this point, we're running 16 parallel query uh, processes uh, per running uh, query. And we also restrict the number of total running processes. It's not a limit we'll ever see, but uh, we do restrict that uh, just to make sure the system doesn't run out of memory. Um, to your second question, um, my more second question. Uh, do you make explicit use of the flash cache? Uh, no, we're not making explicit use of the flash cache. And again, as a best practice recommendation, we find we're getting better caching with um, the, the flash cache. It's a very intelligent logic to maintain, to know what data you're using, what data is likely to be used again. So we find we're getting the, the most benefit of it um, by letting it manage the cache itself. Thank you. Okay, anybody else have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to email exadata at pythian.com and don't forget to drop off your business cards to enter in the drawing for the acrobatic flights for tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Thanks.